Psalms 99. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, The Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. He sitteth between the cherubims. Let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is high above all the people. Let them praise thy great and terrible name, for it is holy. The king's strength also loveth judgment. Thou dost establish equity, thou executest judgment and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt ye the Lord our God, and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Now, we don't know who wrote Psalms chapter number 99, but the psalmist, starting in verse number 1, just starts extolling and praising the Lord for who God is. I mean, if we'd ever really get a hold of how great our God is, like the psalmist got a little bit of a... Uh, a hold of it then without a doubt God's people there would be you know a shout and in, in the camp of God's people but verse number five which is where we're going to take our thoughts from this week it says exalt ye the Lord our God and worship at his footstool for he is holy and then in verse number nine it says exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill for the Lord our God is holy and certainly our God is holy but this entire psalm is about Worship and how we are without excuse not to worship God. Now, over in uh, Psalms 132, verse number 7, we also find that phrase, worship at his footstool. I mean, we can go to you know several places in the Old Testament where it says that the earth is the footstool of God. But here, that's not what it's talking about. It's not saying worship everywhere in the earth. It's saying worship at the footstool of God we can go to a specific place which is the footstool of God. Well, where is that place? Well, look at verse number 1. It says, The Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. He sitteth between the cherubims. Now certainly, we know that in heaven, God has seraphims flying around him all the time. Six wings, two covering their face, two covering their feet, two to flies. Holy, holy, holy. But there are also cherubims in heaven. Well, where else do we find cherubims? in the Bible the Ark of the Covenant if you study out the way that the Ark was made the mercy seat was positioned between two handmade representations of golden cherubims now those cherubims were there to signify that this is a holy place where the mercy seat was put and that uh, in the tabernacle or whether it was the temple whichever incarnation of where the Ark was housed That cherubim was to show that only certain people can approach to this holy place. Then the mercy seat is where the blood was applied. It is where the blood remained until God accepted the offering. Now we're New Testament saints. So where is God's footstool nowadays? Well, again, we could take you to references where it shows that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Once we were saved, we were sealed with the Holy Ghost. He indwells us permanently. Now, we already said over in Psalms 132 that it refers to, I will go into the tabernacle. Yeah. Well, a tabernacle was an impermanent building. Right. It traveled. Right. It was never in the same place more than once or for an extended period of time. That is why it had cloth walls so that they could bear it up and take it to the next place and that there would be a residence for the Ark of the Covenant which God had given them a holy of holies so to speak well see the ark of the covenant and the mercy seat on it was meant to resemble the mercy seat that's in heaven and that mercy seat we cannot go to but I am the temple of the Holy Spirit that is a permanent dwelling the temple that was meant to be established for forever I mean even to this day you can go to Jerusalem and there's a wall of the temple that Solomon was allowed to erect and you know we can go over to the book of first uh, yep first chronicles where David is about ready to dedicate you know Solomon is the next king he's saying I've already put all the supplies together he's saying I can't build it I've got bloody hands God told me I'm not allowed to build the new temple but he said it will be a place where God's footstool is, where we can worship Him. Yeah. Well, what's the mercy seat? It's the place where the blood was applied. We are forever indwelled with the Holy Spirit, and the only reason that's ever going to stop is because of the rapture, because, you know, we check out of this world. 
Well, then I'm with them forever in heaven. It is permanent. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. I can never go anywhere from the moment that I got saved until all of eternity that the Holy Spirit will not reside with me. So, there's a mercy seat in heaven. I can't go there in the flesh. But, he has made me a king and priest, the book of Revelation tells me. A priest so that I can enter directly into the throne room of God. Right. Well, where's the mercy seat? I don't know. But it's somewhere in heaven. Sure. And I know that there's cherubim somewhere around where God's at. Sure. So we went through all of that just to show you that they strove to go into the tabernacle because that was where the item or the thing that God instructed them to make to symbolize that there was a covenant with God. And that's where they worshipped. Well, I have the full realization of that in my soul. Right. So I can worship anywhere. True. I can worship at any time. True. The only thing that limits me from worshiping is me. True. So with the Lord's help this morning, in the wake of all this COVID, and in the wake of the health department, and in the wake of the governor not saying the churches can meet, we're just going to teach on this morning, worshiping wherever, whenever. Amen. Regardless of circumstance, Regardless of what you're going through, regardless of what time of the day it is, worship is something that can happen at any time. Yeah. Not because of anything that we've done, but because of what God has done for us and given us the ability to do as New Testament, washed in the blood, Bible-believing believers. Yeah. Okay, well, first thing, what is worship? Well, we know that worship, as our pastor has taught us so many times, is unreservedly giving our best to God. But how does that manifest? Well, it can, according to Webster's 1828 dictionary, manifest in adoration or praise. Psalm has got a little bit of that in the verses that we read. Sure. He was just talking about how great God, you can certainly worship God through praise or through adoration. But then you can also exhibit it through giving honor to something. Yeah. You worship God when you treat the house of God right. You worship God when you treat the man of God right. Sure. You worship God when you treat the fellow saints right. You worship God, as Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Yeah. Through honor and reverence of who God is and what God says and what God has given us, we can worship. Yeah. But then the final definition that Webster gave as a verb of worship was supreme reverence. Yeah. What's that? That's fear God. Right. That is, thou shalt have no other gods before him. Right. That is supreme reverence. To where everything that you do, we should strive, every action is in the perfect will of God. That is a form of worship. Now, talking about wherever, whenever, certainly we can worship through submission. Through submission. Genesis 22, verse number 5, Abraham said, if we went and read all these verses, we'd be here all day. So I'm going to be paraphrasing, but I'm giving you all the verses. Abraham said that he and Isaac were going yonder to worship. Didn't say he was going to worship. He just received a commandment that he was supposed to offer up his son, Isaac, the one that God promised him, on an altar. Isaac, about halfway up the mountain, got wise and said, hey, where's the sacrifice? Abraham said, God himself will provide a sacrifice. Well, Abraham, we go to the book of Hebrews. And in Hebrews it tells us that Abraham had the faith that even if he had to sacrifice Isaac, God would have raised him from the dead. He said, Isaac and I are going and whatever happens, there's going to be something to worship God. But see, as James and Renee sing the song so often, it's when I lay my Isaac down, I realize it's not my Isaac that God wants, it was me. Abraham submitted and showed that he did not love Isaac more than he loved God. He did not look forward to all that they would do together as father and son more than the promise that God gave him. Because he was a pilgrim and stranger who was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. His faith in the promise that God gave him was more than his love for his only son. And I mean, God the Father broke fellowship with the son because of how many other children he would receive through adoption. God did not love his son more than he loved you. So through submission and saying, not my will, but thine, that is a form of worship. Why? Because that is a supreme form of reverence. That is understanding that God, his ways are above our ways. His ways are above finding out. 
that just by faith sometimes Abraham didn't know how God was going to raise Isaac from the dead Abraham didn't know how God would provide the sacrifice but lo and behold there was a ram caught in a thicket I would have thought that if that ram was caught in a thicket on the way up the mountain they would have seen it it didn't happen until he committed him to the until we're all in God may not reward our submission but regardless submission is a form of worship you're showing God honor and reverence and adoration I love you more than anything else in my life then number two we certainly can worship through service still talking about Abraham and Isaac Genesis chapter number 24 two chapters later verse number 28 Abraham sent the servant to go to his you know the land that he came from his home and he said find Isaac a wife and then in verse number 28 he gets back with the wife with the bride and it's Abraham's servant said that he worshipped when he brought a wife back for Isaac and if you read the verse it says that he gives thanks to God who saw him through the journey that servant was committed with a small fortune he was going through strange lands to get back to a place that he once came from he didn't know what to expect when he got there he knew that he couldn't protect all the wealth he knew that he couldn't find the wife for Isaac he just knew that he had to go and he was trusting that God was going to point out the right one then on top of that he gets back and he realizes the whole way back a lot of things could have happened she could have changed her mind Right, there could have been a caravan or a raiding party come and attack the caravan right. taking away the bride and all the wealth right. he gets back and he's just thankful that the job was done it is a form of worship when you commit yourself to what God has instructed you to do but then you see it through yeah. half service is not half worship right. Right. what happens in these walls is not service it's supposed to be worship right. but when you through study, through listening to preaching, through meditating on the things of God, when God lights on your soul what it is the will of God for you to do, when you do it willingly, happily, and you give all the praise to God for doing what you couldn't do, it's a form of worship. Even the whole way there, he doesn't know what wife he's going to bring back for Isaac. He's saying, Lord, don't give me one that's going to be rotten. Lord, this is the master's son. I want the best bride for her that there could possibly be. Well, in the New Testament, the church is the bride of Christ. Through service, we ought to desire to be the best bride that we can get for the Father's Son. And service, all of it, it wasn't your choice to do it. Although I don't find where that servant throughout the whole story said, No, nah, Abraham, I don't think I can do it. Pick somebody else to go and do it. He willingly accepted, Okay, I'll do my best and he trusted God would do what he couldn't do and that's why God got the glory out of that whole ordeal that's why when he got back it's recorded that the servant worshipped because he had learned from Abraham it's just best to do what God wants you to do but then number three we find that through shifting our cares we can worship First Peter 5 chapter number 7 casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you through faith when we give over those cares whether it's heartbreak, whether it's sorrow whether it's anger, whether it's frustration when we roll our cares and our burdens over onto the Lord because he cares for us that's a form of worship one it's adoration Lord I know that you love me and I love you because you first loved me but I also know you've never let me down that's a recognition of his holiness I mean that's what our text verses said I mean verse number 9 he said exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy for the Lord our God is holy so understanding that he can bear what we cannot bear understanding that he's capable of handling what we cannot handle even when we have stepped out on faith but the times get hard just knowing that he's the friend that sticketh closer than the brother when we confide in him and exhibit our adoration but also recognition of his holiness through honor and reverence it is worship no one can ever know about it but because you live different because you're going through something and you handle it different than the world would God gets honor and glory from it 
But even if nobody else did take notice, it'll still be recorded on your account that you worshipped and your burdens didn't get you to the point that you didn't want to worship. That the pain didn't discourage you from worshiping. Because you cannot go if you try to bear your own load. That's why Jesus said, take your, his yoke upon you, for it's easy. His burden is light. Because he can bear what we cannot bear. But when we hold on to it, we openly say to the rest of the world and to God, either directly or indirectly, I don't think Jesus can handle this for me. Those that were perfectly capable didn't have a providential reason and those that just laid out because they were afraid of the coronavirus, their life did not exhibit worship. Because they could have, but they didn't. Fear quenched their faith. Doubt is a lack of fear. The opposite of, or doubt is a lack of faith. The opposite of faith is fear. I mean, we all can say we got doubt. Lord, help my unbelief. I believe, but help the part of me that doesn't believe. But fear is rejecting faith and embracing what makes sense. But when we roll our cares over on Him, we get rid of the fear. We get rid of the pain, of the shackles of the flesh, and we embrace faith. I don't know when the pain's going to... I don't know when the load's going to get lighter, but I believe He will help me bear it. It's a form of worship. Verse, or the fourth one. Through the sacrifices at the altar, we worship. Now, many different types of sacrifices. We don't have time to get into all of it. But Job, beginning of the book of Job, where do we find him? We find him at the altar. Making sacrifices daily, not just for himself, but for all of his children. Well then, less than two chapters later, where do we find him? Sitting in the ashes of the sacrifices that he had offered up unto God before. Where did he go back? He went back to the altar. He had lost everything, but he knew that there was one place that he could still go. That the only one that could take that away from him would have been God. Because Job said, the altar's not moving. And if you study it out, a bunch of different ways that they, we find that sometimes they'd take 12 stones and they'd make an altar. Sometimes that they would take dirt, like the one, uh, can't remember, Elijah helped the foreigner, and he said, no, 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 I believe in God. I'm going to take dirt from here back home to make an altar out of it. He said, I want God's dirt for God's altar. Now, you can make it out of a whole bunch of different things. But what's important is altars were not just found at the house of God. Were not just found in the tabernacle or outside the tabernacle. Weren't just found at the temple. All throughout the Bible, you'll find that altars are wherever people were when they couldn't get to the house of God. If you've got a prayer closet, great. But if you don't have a place that's your private altar, you're missing something. If you don't have a place that you can... My life verse, Psalm 91.1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. If you don't have a secret place, not just where you can talk to God, but where you can do business with God, because that's what the altar was. The altar is a place of obedience, but it's also a place of sacrifice. We often take for granted that in the Old Testament, they had to raise the animals that they would later put onto the altar. You say, well, they just went out and they took two turtle doves, or they took a lamb, or they took whatever the sacrifice was, a bullock or a ram, whatever it was, and they put it on the altar. No, 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 they raised that. That was out of what they could have lived off of. If it was a male lamb, they could have taken it and it could have sired many more sheep. If it was a ewe lamb, who knows how many sheep that ewe lamb could have bore. If it was two turtle doves, how many eggs could that dove have laid that they could have eaten off of? How many more doves could they have had? But they shucked all of what could have been for obedience unto God. That's the Old Testament. I will take out of what I in the flesh think I need in faith so that God will reward it. Well, what's that? That's keep His commandments. That's the bare minimum. But then we get into Job's situation. Job, when he goes back after he's lost everything, except his life and his wife, he goes and he sits in the ash and he starts scraping those boils off of himself after he found a sharp piece of pottery. What's he rolling over on God? He's sacrificing all his doubt. 
in the flesh, certainly he's thinking, why did all this happen? But by the time his wife brings it up, he says, Lord, give it, Lord, take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Shall we not receive evil and good at the hand? God's in control. Right. How did he get there? He sacrificed his doubt. Yeah, good. Sacrificed his fear. Well, how am I even going to feed my wife? Let alone myself. If a man doesn't provide for his family, he's worse than an infidel. He's thinking, how am I going to provide? He threw that on the altar. Good. He's thinking, what am I going to wear? Maybe he still had his clothes, but maybe they're selling things off so that they can put food on the table. How long is that going to... He threw it all on the altar. He got everything out of the way so that he could still be in the perfect will of God. Because at the altar, something always dies. Nowadays, it's the flesh. Nowadays, it's the insecurities of our heart so that we're not grieving the Spirit anymore our spirit so that it's in perfect alignment with his spirit yeah. worship at the altar is saying God I love you more than this yeah. I trust you more than this God does not demand that we sacrifice it because God loves the cheerful giver right. but if you truly adore God if you truly honor God if you truly have supreme reverence for God when you give up something because you love him more or because you respect his ways more than what makes sense to you. Lean not on your own understanding. Right? The arm of flesh will fail, but God's never let me down. That's a testimony to the rest of the world of worship. Too often we look at what we're losing, but we don't see what we're gaining. When we reluctantly let go, that's not worship. God won't pry it from your hands, but if you reluctantly give it, it's almost as if God wouldn't even want to have it. Because every time you go to do something, let's say, hypothetically, Christian gave up so many hours on the job so that he could go on visitation. Every time he's on visitation, if he did it begrudgingly, he's going to be thinking, I could be making more money right now. Yeah. Every time he's saying it out tracks, nobody's ever going to read this. Nobody's ever going to get help from this. Well, not if you didn't go out and seasoned it with prayer and with you know fasting or if you didn't really put your heart and soul into it God's not going to reward that because you're not doing it out of love and adoration and honor and reverence unto God you're doing it either out of a sense of obligation or you're living not in reverence of God but in true fear of God that if you don't do then you'll be chastised he loved us and there was no begrudging when Christ gave himself on the cross he was not afraid of what would happen when he gave up the ghost and that body went into the grave. It was already all planned out. Sure. Well, in the same way, my life's already planned out. And I have the choice of whether or not to do what God wants me to do. Because God knows what the outcome's going to be either way. God's already seen it. But at the altar, at my private altar, what if I can't get to the house of God? What if I can't get back home? I ought to have an altar resurrected on the foundation of my heart that I can go there and say, Lord, whatever you want, take it. Because just like we said earlier, I'm a priest. I can enter into the throne room of God. I can enter into an altar whenever, wherever. If I've prepared it ahead of time because altars take the preparation. You've got to make sure that whatever you stick on the altar isn't going to come off of the altar. Whatever you let go of isn't going to find its way off of the altar and into a dark corner of your heart. You've got to make sure that the altar's been prepared properly. Well, how's that? Through love. Through adoration. I mean, think of all the times. How long do you think it took Job to make ten sacrifices plus the ones for him and his wife in one day? How much time do you think Job really spent? I mean, because keep in mind, they had to stay there until one offering was completely consumed by the fire before they could put the next one on there. Job was what? He had a lot of servants. I'm not convinced that Job wasn't just out there sacrificing from sun up till sundown. Every day. And he wasn't begrudgingly saying, well, we could have eaten that bullet, or we could have eaten that camel, or we could have eaten that sheep. He's saying, God, it's an honor and privilege to give this unto you. And he spent so much time on the altar that he said, 
Well, my wife may want me to curse God so that this suffering will end. So that she doesn't have to look at me in all this misery no more. But he said, but there's one place I know that God pays attention to. It's right here. I'm sitting right here. If you don't have a private, personal altar, when your life gets turned upside down, it's because the foundation of your heart didn't have an altar there. When your world is shaken, it's because you can't go back to a place that says, I know that God pays attention to this. He's received it too many times on this. He's answered too many prayers right here. The altar is a permanent place of hope, but also a reminder of everything that God's done for us. Because all those offerings, the fat and the meat and the juice all rain down the sides of it. And you can look at it and see, I remember that sacrifice. I remember the last time that I was here and God didn't reject it then, He won't reject me today. You can look and see evidence of what was and isn't there anymore and how much better your life is by routinely going to that altar. Not saying every time you go there to give things up. Sometimes you go there to nail down doubts. Sometimes you go there to nail down your own weaknesses and say, Lord, this is a thorn in the flesh. Or Lord, I've finally gotten a little bit of humility and I understand I'm not strong here. So instead of fretting over it, I'm going to nail it to the altar and give it to you. The altar truly is a place of victory. Because you let go of what is hindering you so that you can get closer to God. When you draw nigh to the altar, he draws nigh to that, that point to you. Right. Well, next, we can worship through study. Well, how did the psalmist know that the Lord reigned in verse number one? How did he know that he sitteth between the cherubims? How did he know that the Lord had been great in Zion and that he was above or high above all the people? How did he know about his great and terrible name and his holiness? How did he know to exalt the Lord God and worship at his footstool? Because he had done some studying. Yeah. Over in Matthew, chapter number 2, verse number 2. The Magi or the wise men, whatever you want to call them, they show up at Herod's. They say, hey, where's he at? We saw a star. We came to worship him. Yeah. They showed up ready to worship. Yeah. But why did they show up ready to worship? Because they had done some studying. Yeah. They weren't from around that part. I dare say they didn't even have a complete copy of the Old Testament. Who knows? But the parts that they did have, they knew one day God's going to send somebody that's going to be king of the Jews. And there's going to be a great and marvelous sign. Well, how'd they know that the sign came? Because they knew what the sky looked like before Jesus. And afterwards they said, that's where he's at. And they kept track of it too. Because by the time they got there, Jesus was probably two years old. So every night they were looking for the star. Every night they were seeing if it had moved until they eventually got to him. Well, there were a lot of people in that day that were a whole lot more educated, had a whole lot more religion, and the Pharisees mocked him to his face. Could anything good come out of Nazareth? Right? Christ isn't going to come from where he came from. Their intellect got in the way, but if you study... What God is, what's that give you? That gives you just more fuel yeah. to show honor unto him because you realize how big he is. Yeah. To show humility and meekness, but submission unto him because you realize all the things that he could do yeah. and all the things that we've done that he'd have an excuse to wipe us off the face of the map. Yeah. All the things that he has planned for us, not just life, life more abundantly. Right. He says, he's. He's ready to open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings on us, but we don't, so he can't. Everything that God desires to do that we inhibit him from doing. Well, when we get in here, or when we listen to preaching, when we start meditating on the things of God, and God starts preaching to us like he did to two men on the road to Emmaus, and the Holy Ghost down in here starts teaching you about himself and about Jesus and about the Father, and you start getting a little bit of insight into who God really is, you can worship through study. Right. You know how many times I've sat down to study and then not even get through what I planned on studying because about halfway through God showed me something and I couldn't stop thinking about it because yeah. it blew my mind. Yeah. Or you get in here and the verse that 
you know, you've been looking for for who knows how long. You just, all of a sudden, you'd read it before. You'd seen it before. You may have had that one memorized. But when God put his finger on it, it gave you a reason to worship. You cannot worship if you don't know about the one that you're worshiping. You cannot go to the altar and worship unless you know what you're supposed to do at the altar. You cannot worship through service if you don't know what God wants you to do in your everyday life. You cannot worship through submission if you don't know how great God really is. You see, we're human and we forget and we get used to the idea of God, but then the Bible reminds us you can't know God. The only reason we know Him is because He desired to know us. Everything we know about God, God told us about Himself. That's why it was written down here, so that we wouldn't pervert it. And that they were the words of God that tell us how great God is. Through study, we desire to know more about God, and He fulfills that desire. What's all that do? R builds and strengthens our faith, which is why through shifting our cares on Him. You won't roll your cares over on Jesus if you don't believe that Jesus can handle them. Right. If you neglect the Word, your worship will be weak. Yeah. True. But then, we can also worship through speaking with God. Well, what's that? That's prayer. The definition of prayer is worship. Right. Right. Now, there are four different types of prayer that we can find enumerated in the New Testament. But what do all of those things do? They do one of the things that the definition of worship is. Well, what's thanksgiving? That's praise and adoration unto God. What's intercession? That's having faith that God can do for others that we can't, that maybe nobody else can. That's worship. Through supplication. What's that? Well, that may be rolling my cares over on Him, or it may be, Lord, I know you're going to do it, but I'm just begging you to do it in your time. Or Lord, I'm begging that you prepare me so that I'm ready when you go to do it. And then there's prayer, which is the worship form of it. But when you set aside time, because certainly we can pray without ceasing being a state of prayer, but when you delegate time, and you say, this is the time I'm talking to God, you're rejecting the world, you're rejecting family, you're rejecting others, you are seeking God purely and solely. When he said, seek my face, that's what he was talking about. He's saying, get in the Word, but then let the Word make an impact on you, and then communicate with God on it. The reason that prayer is worship is because true prayer is getting our spirit lined up with the Spirit of God so that there is no grieving or quenching of the Holy Spirit. So that we are in perfect unity so that we can have supplication. That we can dine with the Father. Yeah. That every day we can feel the actual presence of God. Because some days we're like Job. Look to the left, look to the right, look in front, look back. Can't find Him. But we know He's still out there. But when our spirit gets lined up with His spirit, His presence is made manifest in our life. Right. When we constantly talk to Him, we understand things aren't coincidence. Things aren't accident. That God knew Corona was going to happen at the same moment that He knew Christ was going to come to the, the cross. Because right. He's omniscient. He knows everything. Right. Nothing catches God by surprise. Deep. But where are we reassured of that? Yeah. In prayer. Deep. Prayer is letting the Word influence the words that we speak. Right. When we get this in us, it shows us what we need to let up. Because yeah. you know what? Through study, it's a whole lot better when you're praying while you're studying. Yeah. Through sacrifices, they're a whole lot better when you're talking to God about why you're giving it up and why you love Him more than what you're giving up or why, even though you're giving it up, you have faith that He's going to fill the need or the void in who you are. Yeah. That when you, It's really hard to shift your cares on Christ when you're not talking to Him. True. It's really hard to serve when you don't know what the Master desires you to do or when you're not relaying... Well, Lord, I need some more direction. I don't know what to do here. Or, Lord, I'm going to do my best and just pray that you open the doors. It's a whole lot easier to submit when you're talking to the one that you need to submit to. It's real hard to submit something when there's nobody to receive it. 
You can fill out an application for all those small business loans that the government funded, but unless you turn them into somebody, they're not going to get rewarded. Prayer, a word which its definition is worship. Everything about it is, not my will but done. Everything is, I'm not good enough, but he is. Prayer is where the rubber meets the road on, well, why do we take the cross with us every day? Take up the cross daily and follow me. Because I got to nail the flesh to that every single day. And I can't get rid of it, so I got to take it with me every day. But see, I'm not strong enough to nail the flesh down. He's given me the tools to rule and reign over it. But the nails stick a whole lot better when I ask the Lord to drive the nail as I'm holding it. The flesh stays there a little bit longer when I talk to the Lord about what it's been doing. Why it's been irritating me. You cannot have an understanding of somebody if you don't talk to them. God can talk to you all day, but until you humble yourself, until you submit yourself to get in a quiet place with God and say, okay, Lord, I'm ready to do it. Abraham had to get, Abraham received God wanted to make it a great nation out of him. Abraham didn't have to leave home. He just said, Okay, Lord. You know what the testimony of Abraham was? He was the friend of God. You gotta to talk to God a lot to be the friend of God. Enoch talked to God so much, God just took him one day. You tell me that Elijah didn't talk to God a lot? When he prayed on top of the mountain and fire came down he said I've done as you have instructed me to do he'd been talking to him about what he was going to be doing before he did it he got all the instructions and made sure that all the I's were dotted and T's were crossed nowhere do I see where he had to pray and say okay I got to figure out what God wants to do with this next bit he already knew how did he do that well he understood what God wanted and then he got Elijah out of the way through prayer because if you start talking to God about how you can't, you're going to hear pretty quick on all the ways that He can. Yeah. When you're transparent enough, when you're honest enough, and when you're sincere enough to do business with God, He always does business. Yeah. But that is accomplished through the mode of prayer. That is the way we communicate to God. He talks to us through His Word, and the Word is discerned through the Spirit. Yeah. The preaching we hear is in spirit and in truth. We have to worship Him in truth. We cannot truthfully worship until we obey and do pray and roll the things off of ourselves and commit things to the altar. If we don't do it, we can't have it. Now say, why is worship so important day in, day out? If you don't worship out there, you won't worship in here. People that only prepare throughout the week to come and worship in the house of God have a very weak worship. It is very shallow. A lot of times, a whole lot more shouting during the singing than there is during preaching. But right, singing's easy to get excited. But when you hear, oh, he's preaching against all the stuff I did this week. True worship is, Lord, thank you for showing me that. Let's get it made right. Because what is that? That is, he's holy. I'm not. I love him more than I love me. I reverence him, and like Job, I eschew or despise or hate evil. If there's evil in me, get it out, Lord. That's what worship isn't in a shout. Worship isn't in a song. Worship isn't in a message. Worship is in the attitude of the believer and preparing for worship. Because worship takes work. If it's easy, every place would be a house of worship but a lot of congregations not much worshiping going on and even though the government may tell us well hey you can't congregate together I can worship wherever whenever it's just sweeter when the brethren dwell in unity it's sweeter when all come out and say we've set this time aside just to come out and let others know how much we love and worship God we congregate to show that there's something different so that the unbelievers come in and become believers. But worship is the 
you know, big, bold, yellow highlighter. It's the underlined a couple of different times, put up in big neon signs, the proof of authenticity on your testimony. Without worship, you're just another one of them. Without worship, you're just somebody that thought that they had all the answers till they didn't. Without worship, you're just another person who got caught off by the wayside. You may have been beat up like the, the man that the Good Samaritan helped. And somebody may have come by your way and helped you. More likely not, that was Jesus. But after you got better, you never left the sick bed. Worship is what shows what's true and what's fake. The Pharisees tried to worship, but Jesus said, that wasn't worship. He's just bragging about what all he had done this week. What did Abraham's servant do? He said, you're not going to believe how God worked all this out. Because he knew he couldn't do it. But he knew that God could. The Pharisees had learned all the prophets, but they weren't looking for Jesus. So many others, the Gentiles, they had altars to the unknown God. Well, you can know them. And once you know them, you ought to desire to worship them. Because if you're not worshiping, you're not winning the Christian fight. You haven't fought a good fight. You haven't finished your course because we are exalted to worship. Worship's where your passion gets renewed every day. Worship's where you find a little bit more fuel in the gas tank when you thought you ran out. Worship's where you can bunker down and survive a storm because you know that the foundation that you got is going to hold. The house may be torn away, but you know you're going to be safe on the rock. You cannot be shaken because worship daily realigns you into the will of God. There's nothing that you can do to reign the flesh in. But through worship, God will honor it and reign the flesh in with you. There's nothing you can do to merit God's favor to answer or have your prayers answered. But regardless of whether they get answered, you can still worship and show that there's something real about being a Christian. That even if you had to endure all the pain all over again, you'd do it because Christ was worth it. There's a lot of people carrying weights around, but very few are carrying a cross with worship in their eyes with praise on their lips, with submission evident in their lives. And here's the thing. If you do it privately, it's going to work its way out, outwardly. Worship always starts in here, but eventually it just bubbles over. And we all worship a little bit different, but we all have to do it the same way. That's according to the way that God said do it. Well, how do we worship? Where do we worship? When do we worship? That's all up to you. But we're without excuse, like the psalmist said, not to worship Him. So whether or not you're one of the ones that got put on the list for this week or the week after that or the week after, I don't know how long they planned it out, know that you can worship wherever, whenever. And a lot of Christians haven't learned to worship wherever. And that's why from Monday to Saturday they're defeated throughout their daily life. They're wondering why the gas from Sunday morning wore off so quick. Because you're supposed to worship individually. So that when we come collectively, the worship just shows up and the big preacher shows up. Those are really good services. But that doesn't happen if I'm not practiced up out there. If I haven't lived worship out there. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.